Richard Tauber, born May 1891, died January 1948. What made him one of the greatest tenors, the finest Mozart singer of his time? What drove him on through his extraordinary career from the opera stage in Vienna to musical comedy in London? From an early beginning as a music student to an early end of 56, as an accomplished singer, concert conductor, and composer of love songs. He'd been married twice and had a roving eye. A piano and a beautiful girl is all I need, then I'm happy, he said. He had a unique restlessness for world travel, with no desire for a home of his own. He spent his life in hotels and flats. A man with no capacity for saving, he was extravagant, generous to a fault. He died in debt to the inland revenue. In 1932, Hitler brought an end to his singing career in Berlin, where he was known as the Caruso of Germany. And cancer of the lung brought an end to a man who had gone through life fighting every possible odds from his birth out of wedlock to, well, to what? We know about the voice, but what about Tauber the man? Tonight we're going to find out from those who knew and loved him. him sing that. It was a very humbling, unforgettable experience. It was my second meeting with Tauber. The first, I had utterly refused him. I heard him sing Goethe in a musical by Lehar. And I thought he was just a musical comedy clown who could sing. I'd gone there to see an actress whom I loved very much, Kate Dorsch. She played Friedrich, and now she didn't offend me at all in that part, but he did. It was awful. I think I left before the end. But then about a year or so later, I went to the opera to hear 
Don Giovanni, because there was a new Don whom they were all talking about, Michael Bonin, and I went to see him, to hear him. And what I really heard and saw was Tauber singing Ottavio. <laughs> it was good luck that I was in a box by myself. I went out of my mind. I was so shaken. And I was so humbled by my first refusal of such an enormous artist he was a polished musician who not only knew his part, but every other part, including the entire score, in order to create from the complete work. Extremely important with Mozart. Tyler had made an exceptional character study of this role and gave the nobleman, rather unkindly handled in the opera, a certain gutsy toughness and quality. He was an extraordinary man because whatever happened, and there are many well-known conductors who don't have this flair, he could make an orchestra play. And that's a great thing about a conductor. Many, many famous men can flog themselves to death, but they can't get the heart of the orchestra into the palm of their hand. And Richard somehow could. Well, Richard wasn't a great actor at all. But this voice was absolute magic. I remember when I first heard it, I was a child, and I was fascinated by it. But the strange thing about this was that I used to hear him sing on the radio, of course, all the time. And when I was taken to hear him sing in a theater, I was amazed to hear the people around me saying, oh, but he hasn't got a very big voice. It isn't a very powerful voice, is it? And this was my first reaction to artificial sound, radio, in fact, that is so easy to turn a knob up and have volume increased. Richard Tarbell was one of the finest conductors the London Philharmonic Orchestra ever worked with. I think at nearly 30 years removed, this is forgotten. It's certainly not forgotten by the audiences of those days, I'm sure, and certainly not by the players who played under him. He knew every note of every score he conducted. He conducted without scores, of course, and gave stupendous performances of even classical works, not just the, the, the light music repertory, Works like Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, for example, uh, the players would talk of it in the same terms as the performances given of that work by Beecham and Eric Kleiber. This shows, I think, the class of musician we are dealing with. Richard had a very complicated character. It took the help of Sigmund Freud in Vienna for me to really understand the reasons for his complexes. When the war separated us in 1940, he was very unfaithful. But I must admit, I cheated too but we never lied to each other. Richard always looked after and supported his girlfriends to the end of his life. And yet, you know, he mistrusted women. He thought they loved him for his money, for his fame, but not for himself. And to a certain extent, you know, this was true. He had a very, um, shall we say, physical disability. He had a limp, a squint from birth. He had wrists were stiff with from rheumatism and then of course he was very fat but he had a heart of gold Tarbo was willing to sing anything that was within his range and not likely to damage his voice. 
He made his reputation on his middle voice, which is so right for German singing. There was no public in England during the war for his singing on the opera stage. Audiences wanted his light operetta and musical comedy to lighten the wartime bombing and misery. But it was here in Linz, capital of Upper Austria, not far from Vienna, where Richard was born to a Roman Catholic, Elizabeth Seifert, a widow of over 40. She was a soubrette at the local municipal theatre. Her maiden name was Denemy, and Richard was known as Karl Richard Denemy until he was formally adopted by his father when he was 21 and he took on his father's name. Richard Anton Tauber, straight actor, 10th child of a Jewish wine merchant born in Hungary, adopted the Catholic faith. His mother's career was almost over and poor Richard was dragged around on tours of provincial theaters. Money was short and fortunately, Maria Kai, the rich daughter of the publisher, offered to take young Richard in. But Maria began to educate him into the Jesuit priesthood. Richard's father returned from an American tour in time to save him and to meet his son for the first time. He took over Richard's welfare and he and the boy moved to Berlin where they stayed for three years. Richard was sent to school, but his mind was on the theater. His father, however, was set on a musical career for his son and the violin and piano were chosen. When Richard was 12, his father was appointed to the court theater at Wiesbaden and Richard, intent on becoming a singer, befriended Heinrich Hensel, the court theater's leading tenor through whom Richard was to develop an obsession about singing. Richard followed Hensel about, learning every note, acting as his dresser on tour, even copying his style of dress. But Papa Tauber was set upon his son's musical training and sent Richard to the music conservatoire at Frankfurt to study as a conductor. Richard's father had married a widow with two sons by now, and Richard's foster family encouraged him to carry on with his singing career. They secured an audition for him with the famous singing teacher, Carl Bynes. Bynes felt Richard had the makings of a beautiful bel canto voice, but he stipulated stern conditions and discipline. He made Richard promise not to sing in public for at least 18 months, not to attempt Wagner, for it was not suited to his voice. In return, Bynes promised to make him the greatest Mozart singer in the world. 18 months later, Bynes was asked for a tenor replacement at the Mannheim Court Theatre and recommended Richard, who was offered a two-year contract. And a year later, in 1913, Richard sang Tamino in Mozart's The Magic Flute for the first time. This was in the theater in Chemnitz, where his father had been appointed general manager. Richard Tauber's brilliant opera career had begun. Tauber was a typical Viennese, with all the Viennese charm, uh, with all the Viennese lightness and capacity for transferring, for putting across humor, and, of course, he had the most magnificent and beautiful lyric voice. I have no hesitation in saying that he was one of the greatest lyric tenors of the age. Uh, he was, um, he had, the, as I say, the most enormous charm which he could put across in the theater. And this was uh, quite a considerable achievement because uh, Tauba was lame. And you would have thought that anything, a, a figure on the stage being lame, would have detracted from his performances, but they didn't. The charm and the, the uh, quality to be liked came over in all his performances. Richard Tauber was uh, no doubt the greatest tenor I've had the fortune to hear, or for that matter, to sing with. And uh, if I have to assess him in any way, I think uh, I can't do it better than perhaps compare him to Fritz Kreisler. I had the fortune in New York still to meet Fritz Kreisler when he was alive. I never heard him other than on records. But I remember the first record which my husband played me of Fritz Kreisler. I was on the top floor in our apartment and he played it downstairs. And I raced down three floors because I'd never heard such a such an individual sound on the violin before, ever. And I know that, for instance, Oistrach said that was still the king of the violinists because of that wonderful individual sound and the various other things like rubato and rhythm and so on. The same, I think, applies to Richard Tauber. <laughs> Mein Herz ist voll 
ich muss dich soll. Es singt und klingt alle Zeit, in mir die holde Lieder der Seligkeit. Und das so bin ich ja. Mir nie. Freu mich der frohen goldenen Stunden, da ich so rein und tief empfunden, Gott, jedes Lied ist dein, denn nur du allein, gehst du mir ein, den Berg zu dienen, frei. Richard had an exceptional musical memory and learned his roles quickly, thereby enabling himself to take over coveted roles at short notice. He came to the rescue at a performance of Richard Strauss's Ariadna of Naxos at the Dresden Opera House two years later, but that performance led to a five-year contract with the Dresden Opera until 1918. A few years later, when Richard was appearing as a guest artist in Dresden, the role of Kalaf in the German premiere of Thiomadot was to have been sung by Kurt Taucher, but he was taken ill and Tauber was begged to take the part. After only three days learning the part which it went on. Tabo was exempted from the 1418 war, but sang to the troops on the front line. The Austrian and German opera houses vied for his services, and he was appointed a royal Kammersänger. But being an Austrian, the Vienna State Opera was his goal, and he was contracted to them for a number of years, during which time he sang 29 different roles. <laughs> Like Richard's father, Franz Lehar was born in Hungary. He'd heard Richard's voice, fallen in love with it, and waited a year for him to become free from opera commitments to sing his new operetta, Faskita. There began a new and lasting friendship. Never in the history of light music, Tava had said, has there been such a friendship between artist and composer. <laughs> I 
Stelle dich bereit gemacht. Für dein Stell dich ein. Sei mal. The Tauber Lied became an established must for Lehar operettas, and Lehar wrote girls were made to love and kiss, especially for Tauber, for his new operetta Paganini, which Tauber helped to world fame in Germany in 1926. When criticized for prostituting his opera voice in preference for operetta, Tava snapped back, I sing Le Ha, not operetta. Tava met and married singer Carlotta van Conti in 1927. This was due largely to Lea Seidel, who was later to star in England in many successes, including Federica and White Horse Inn. I was in Vienna in those days, doing three weeks as a guest artist and Countess Maritza, which was a classic, you see. And... Uh, just that evening, I went back to Berlin, and my understudy was there. So Richard was very disappointed because he came to see me. And uh, he said to the producer who was with him in the box, well, I, this is very annoying. And this man said, oh, do be kind to her because she is so proud. She thinks that you came specially for her. So Richard was very flattered and kind as he is, went backstage. And when he saw her nearby, he absolutely fell for her. So uh, then the story goes, there was a little conductor who was a very naughty, cheeky little man, and he was very short too. And uh, he watched through the keyhole when they rehearsed together, and he saw that Richard was trying desperately to make love to her, and she said, oh no, I have no thoughts of this, I'm very upset, I've pawned all my jewelry. So he said, well, you will be out of trouble. I get them all out. It cost him many thousand pounds. Then they married very soon after. And unfortunately, she was very unwise. She tried to give him singing lessons, and I think that killed the marriage. <laughs> At some stages in his career, this arthritis had given rise to very serious concerns. In 1927, while he was singing in Friederike, for instance, all further performances had to be cancelled because he was unable to move and he had to be taken by ambulance to the Slovakian spa, Pistian, where these uh, joint conditions were treated with mud packs and such like. The condition was so severe that the newspaper said that his uh, uh, career had obviously now come to an end. Franz Lehar had written an operetta called The Yellow Jacket, which had flopped in provincial theatres. One day, Tauber visited Lehar after his illness and looked through some of his music. He came across the now famous You Are My Heart's Delight. Wonderful, Tauber said. I play a Chinaman and hide my arthritic wrists under the kimono sleeves. Use the characteristic walk to conceal the limp in his lame left leg. In the end, Land of Smiles was born. The first night of Land of Smiles was conducted by Lehar himself, on his 60th birthday at the Berlin Metropole in 1929. The following year, in 1930, Tauber made his film debut in Das Dirnenlied, for which he wrote the title song, Ich glaube nie mehr in einer Frau. Still slightly crippled from his illness, he found filming gave him physical relief from the demands of the stage. He formed his own film company to make Das Lockende Ziel and Das Drei Mädelhaus, Lilac Time. However, his film company collapsed and his divorce from Van Conti came through at the same time. After performances with Lotto Lehmann, Elisabeth Schumann, Gita Alpar, Maria Jeritza, Fritzi Massari, Annie Ahlers, Jarmila Novotna, and Rita Georg, Tauber left to England, where in 1931 he opened in Lehar's Land of Smiles at Drury Lane. But he developed throat trouble, and even though his stand-in took over, the show ended after only a few weeks. He took on an American concert tour and returned to England in concert in provincial towns and the Albert Hall. On the day, further throat trouble prevented his appearance and the disappointed Sunday audience had to be turned away. For a while, Richard became rather unpopular with the British public. In Holland, Tauber mounted a production of Lilac Time called Dry Madel House, the life story of Franz Schubert, which transferred to the Old Witch Theatre in London.
Blossom Plan, the screen version of Lalik Town, was filmed by British International Pictures. Later, my husband, Tom Owens, presented Richard in the stage version of Blossom Town at the New Theatre, co-starring Anne Somerset, Hello Curtsy, and Peter Graves. And here is an extract from the film. I loved making Blossom Town. And of course it was a great thing for me, very early in my career, playing opposite Tauber. There was a lovely experience working with him. He had this exuberant personality, tremendous vitality. He seemed to infuse the whole studio with his vitality, like a great shining sun. And he was very sympathetic, very kind. It really was my happiest film. <laughs> I remember one rather anguished afternoon. It was a scene in which I had to cry and uh, we'd rehearsed it. Paul Stein, the director, said, you know, take a few minutes to just get in the mood. So I wandered off into a dark corner, hopefully, thought of all the saddest things I could. And the harder I tried, the drier eyed I became. I absolutely hoped as I couldn't produce a tear. So after a little while, Paul Stein got rather fed up and called to the makeup man, Harry, go and get the glycerin. So I was feeling awful, absolutely ashamed. Harry came back with his glycerin bottle. I was really feeling the lowest form of life. Tauber said to me very reproachfully, Jane, I thought you were an actress. And I 
burst into tears. <laughs> Everybody was so delighted, <laughs> including myself. Shortly before the filming of Blossom Time began, uh, Taubo went to the Viennese opera with a work of Lehar's called Gudita. This is quite a historical thing because it was the first time in the history of the Viennese opera that an operetta was performed there. Uh, this is quite a sort of historical point. He, uh, th this operetta was a typical piece, full of charm, full of lyricism, uh, with a trifle of sentiment here and there, and Tava was extremely well matched by Novotna, who was one of the most delightful sopranos on, in the Viennese theatre. When Richard returned to England, he began filming Heart's Desire, in which he sang the lovely Vienna city of my dreams. Come ah. La 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 Mein Herz und mein Sing schwärmt stets nur für Wien, für Wien, wie es weint, wie es lacht. Da kenn ich mich aus, da bin ich. was the premiere of another British film, Mimi, starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Gertrude Lawrence, the star we met Diana Napier. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. introduced us. It was at the first night of Mimi. We were engaged in 1935, and I went with him to Vienna. We had a lovely house in Schönbrunn. I heard Richard singing for the first time that year in The Singing Dream, in Zurich, with Mary Lossip. He had composed this operetta for Mary. She was a great love of his for a long time. She was so beautiful, I couldn't imagine why he wanted to marry me. I was terribly jealous of her. But opposition from his ex-wife interrupted our plans to get married. Carlotta informed Richard that their divorce five years before was valid in Germany alone, that he was still legally her husband outside Germany. She threatened to take the intimate story of their married life to the national press unless he agreed to pay her the five years allowances. Richard hated unpleasantness, and to avoid a scandal, he paid up. But Carlotta demanded more and more money to legalize their divorce outside Germany. So Richard sued her for extortion. He won the case, and also his complete freedom. At last, we were free to marry. We married at the Maribyrn Town Hall on June the 20th, 1936. When like a star you shine on me Change in my whole night through You 
Leha, however, felt that Tabu was spending too much time in England and not enough on the operettas he'd specially composed for him. He persuaded Tabu to do a production in London of Paganini. It was presented by C.B. Cochrane and also starred Evelyn Lay. first asked to go into Paganini and I read the script I thought oh my goodness what a very old-fashioned story this is but I wanted so much to sing with him and also to be with the late Charles B Cochran but I waved that by I said to myself this is going to be a great experience and you're going to learn something from this man after all he's a very great singer a much greater singer than you so I dived into it. A lot of the part that I had to play wasn't very good. For instance, when I wanted to make an exit or perhaps to make an entrance, I was lacking in something. I was lacking in something musical to sing or to say. And I found in Richard a most generous partner. He would give me, oh, chunks of his stuff to sing because he thought it would help me and uh, be better for my part. But once more the show proved a flop despite its previous success abroad and a concert tour of Holland, Belgium and America followed. There he is with Grace Moore at her honeymoon cottage with his lifelong friend Marlene Dietrich. Walt Disney, Jeanette MacDonald. We toured all over the world. In fact, we lived in suitcases. Richard had a contract to appear in a Leha tour of Italy and the south of France. I stayed on in Monte Carlo. He telephoned me from Milan. I have a sore throat. I'm going to see my doctor in Vienna, he said. But stormtroopers had massed on the Austrian border, and I was very worried about Richard's safety. I rang Randolph Churchill in London. Stop him, Diana, he said. It's sheer lunacy. I begged Richard over the telephone not to go. Austria at war, he scoffed. Nonsense. I was so worried, I drove overnight to Milan, where I found him at the station waiting to leave for Vienna. I managed to persuade him to put the trip off till the next day. The following morning, he handed me the newspapers. German Reich invades Austria, the headline read. The rape of his beloved country had begun. Richard never saw his mother again. She died in 1940. Landers smiles with Richard, Mary Lossif, and Hella Curti opened in Cape Town. Four days after landing in South Africa, the Second World War started. We were without nationality. I telephoned the parliamentary private secretary to Winston Churchill for advice. Leave for neutral Switzerland and wait until your papers are ready, he said. Richard became an Englishman in 1940 
but it cost him thousands in back taxes. We came back to England with our new travel documents. Friends came to the rescue and Richard was naturalized, but he had no work. Sweetie, he said to me, how can I support you and all my girlfriends if I have no job? Before I was posted to Scotland with the Polish army, jokingly, I took a pin, came down on the daily newspaper and landed on one of George Black's shows. I rang George up. Could you possibly put on Richard's singing dream? I asked him. But George had other commitments and put Diana in touch with my husband. Tom thought it was a very good idea, but knowing what wartime England was like, he thought that it would be much too expensive and very difficult to put on a new show and suggested that perhaps a revival would be better. Land of Smiles was chosen and Richard had Josie Fearn uh, starring in it. Oh, she had such a beautiful voice, a really heavenly voice, a rare voice, I would say. And he went out on tour and played for over a thousand performances. After the success of Land of Smiles, Richard had an idea for another show, which was Old Chelsea. Bernard Delfont presented Old Chelsea with Richard and Carolyn and, um, let me see, uh, Nancy Brown. She was in it, too. Uh, it was a wonderful show, and the great hit number in the show uh, was My Heart and I. We often discussed a mutual musical but somehow the idea never materialized. Then one day, it was during the war, we walked in uh, the uh, glorious old world village of Cockington in Devon. It was spring and rhododendron and magnolia were in bloom and suddenly Richard said, now, what about this musical of ours? Shouldn't we write it? Yes, I said we should, but where do we take the libretto from? So Richard suggested a Viennese setting, and uh, then a Russian, and then a Spanish. Uh, suddenly I looked around the countryside and I waved my hand and I said, and what about this here, England? And he began to call and to shout, yes, 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 Napula, you are right. Come on, my friend, let's begin. So we began, and that's how old Chelsea was born. <laughs> Because I was just starting out, I'd done no real big musical shows. I've been doing intimate review, you know, and straight shows. And this was the first show I'd ever done, and it was terrifying for me, you know, to sing with somebody like Richard. And um, 
I don't think I could have done it with anybody else, frankly. You know, he, he was such a terrific help. And he, he made you feel that you were really contributing something, you know. I wasn't just a sort of little girl just starting out. And it was marvellous. Uh, he, I learned tremendously from him in all these lovely top notes that he used to get, which uh, I was able to learn so much in this way from him, you know. And uh, I don't know, he was just a marvellous person altogether as far as I was concerned. But Tauber had been neglecting his first love, conducting, and on being invited so to do, seized the opportunity to conduct the London Philharmonic Orchestra in London and on tour in the provinces during the war years. As he felt his throat still needed rest, he conducted Gay Rosalinda, the English version of Strauss's Die Fledermaus, here at the Palace Theatre in February 1945. I had a song right after my entrance in the second act. It was a rather a good entrance, and he used to vary it, but I used to come on. Sometimes he'd let me come on with no music, and then to amuse himself and to amuse me, because he loved practical jokes, he would tell the orchestra to play well, pr more or less anything, to make me laugh, you see. So that built the whole thing up. But very soon after that entrance, I had a song called Chacun à son goût. And one night, we'd been running about nine months, I gave him the cue for the music. And nothing happened. I looked down, no music, nothing. And there he was, sitting in the conductor's chair, and he dropped off. He was sound asleep. <laughs> so I got up. I went down to the footlights and said my line at him and woke him up. <laughs> he started to giggle and the band played and I had no breath left to sing. However, we sang it and the audience caught on to the whole thing and we had an ovation <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> the number never went so well. <laughs> Richard and I were reunited after many wartime separations. America, Diana, we go. I sing Land of Smiles but the book had been changed and was retitled Yours Is My Heart. It was terrible. A pantomime well, Richard. My well, disaster struck. She was constantly after you to throw trouble. Even though John Hendrick was a great success as understudy, and Richard guaranteed equity to keep the show going, without Richard, the ill-fated Yours Is My Heart closed, leaving Richard in the worst financial position of his life from which he never recovered. The motley and the pain and the powder The people pay you and to want their love you know If I'm the queen, your son
In July 1947, during the run of the bird cellar which he was conducted, symptoms appeared which made it necessary to have his chest examined by x-rays. Very unfortunately, it was obvious that he was suffering from a malignant disease, from a cancerous condition of a lung. The only thing to do was to recommend an operation that referred him to Lord Brock. It was clear that one lung had to be sacrificed if any attempt was to be made to save him at all. Poor Richard. He believed to the end that he had an abscess in his lung the same as Caruso had. But he said to me, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to sing at Covent Garden from Don Giovanni. In September 1947, just a little more than a year after this theater was reopened at the end of the war, we invited the Viennese State Opera here. And I think this was probably the first time in its history that the entire company with a repertoire of works came outside Vienna. Uh, Tarver was here at the time, and he wrote me a letter asking if he could possibly sing in one of his great Viennese successes. I said that the company were my guests, I wasn't in control of them, but I would see what I could do. So I talked to the Viennese and said that I knew it had been a great deal, deal to Tarba to appear with his former company. So on the last night of the season, in this house, he appeared in Don Giovanni. He was not absolutely well at the time, and of course the change of the easy technique of the musical comedy to the more disciplined job of singing in opera certainly taxed him. And what's more, he sang this demanding role virtually on one lung. I can remember the perspiration flowing off his face, but he gave a very great performance. Yes, and we had very, already very famous people in the company, like Lyuba Velic, as she was the very famous Salome, and like Hilde Konetsny, who was a wonderful Fidelio, and Hotta, oh, and yes. Seyfried, and uh, Yuri Nuts, and uh, Mm -hmm. And also, well, certain Miss Schwarzkopf was sort of one of the underlings, but I was there. The baby of the party. <laughs> Not exactly the baby, but they couldn't really go without me because I was there, Donna Elvira, and also there, Marcellina in, in Fidelio. And so uh, I was with them. And uh, a great big good fortune it turned out for me because not only did I uh, did those, uh, do those performances, but uh, encountered this famous performance of uh, Richard Tauber as Donna Tarvi, and also was later engaged back by Sir David Webster to Covent Garden. And then uh, my relationship with my not then husband deepened. <laughs> Richard Tauber never rehearsed with us. He had no piano rehearsal, he had no orchestra rehearsal, there was no time for an orchestra rehearsal because it was already the last performance of Don Giovanni, which he was doing with us. I had never, never heard any tenor uh, sing with this beauty of tone before, uh, plus the control, plus the breathing control, plus the expression, plus the uh, clean intonation. Well, it's, you can go on about the pluses and the pluses. But the applauding audience did not realize it was witnessing the tragic farewell to the greatest Mozart singer of his time. As Richard's secretary for the last 10 years of his life, I can remember the last recording he did. It was at the BBC, and it was the day following the Don Giovanni at Covent Garden. That was on the Saturday, and this was on the Sunday. He did two recordings. One went out live, and one was to be pre-recorded because he was going to have his operation on the Thursday. 
we'd been along to the place and we'd been rehearsing and the usual um, little rest in the dressing room and a fit of coughing, of course, which he got over. And then he went back again into the theatre. The rehearsal continued and then it was ready to go on the air. And so ends the Richard Tarber program. In this final performance, you heard Richard Tarber himself appearing by arrangement with Bernard Delfont, his guest Nova Pilbeam, Percy Khan at the piano, and the orchestra led by Alec Furman under the direction of George Malacrino. Richard Tarber died in the early hours of January the 8th, 1948. A requiem mass took place at St. James's Spanish Place, London, on January the 12th, and he was buried here at the Brumpton Cemetery. <laughs>